joining us today, those that are in person and those that may be watching the live stream at home, all of the love and support is greatly appreciated by the family. I would just like to make a reminder for everyone that is in person today, if you could please make sure that your cell phones or any kind of electronic devices are turned off or on silent so they are not going off during the service. And for those who are able, would you please <laughs> Please be seated. Greetings. I am the Reverend Dr. Jody Hall. I am honored to assist with today's celebration of life for Allison Archibald Ferguson, known fondly her whole life as Cricket. Alongside me is the Reverend Dr. Anne Beatty Stokes, longtime best friend of Cricket's. Together, we will lift up Cricket's memory. We will recall the richness of her remarkable talents and her infectious spirit of curiosity and be inspired by the loyal, warm, generous, inviting, and playful approach Cricket brought to every single day. We have chosen to weave the poetry of Mary Oliver throughout Cricket's celebration of life as it often speaks to the cycles of growth, renewal, and transformation. Through each verse, we re find reminders of the enduring beauty and resilience of the human spirit, echoing the essence of Cricket. Cricket was the beloved wife of the late James Jim Ferguson, mother of Kelly and John Ferguson, and later welcoming into the family fold, John's wife, daughter-in-law, Erica. Cricket was the cherished sister of Anne Monroe and sister-in-law to Annie's husband, Alex, a dearly loved aunt of Brendan and Ian Monroe, and Ian's wife, Kimberly Gale, and the great aunt of Winnie Monroe. Among all the roles that Cricket embraced, her role as grandma of John and Erica's children, Blaze, Maggie, and Charlie, was one that brought her endless pleasure. Grandma sleepovers, tea parties, and picnics with Maggie, reading and story time and coloring with chalk on the sidewalk are among the most cherished of memories that they will carry forward. Cricket was a daughter, a sister, a wife, a mother, a grandma, an auntie, a cherished friend, a neighbor, a community mobilizer, and so much more than any of these roles could capture. As we gather here today on the cusp of spring, we are reminded of the beauty and symbolism of the season that is all around us. Spring brings rain, a gentle breeze, sometimes gusts of breeze, and eventual the promise of blooming flowers. In many ways, the arrival of spring mirrors the process of our own lives, death and rebirth. As the earth awakens from its slumber, so too does the soul awaken to its new reality of life beyond the confines of an earthly body. Gathering for us in the way that we are today offers us all a very personal invitation to take pause, to reflect, and to ask ourselves, what is our legacy? Am I living my life as intended to its fullest of potential? While Cricket's physical self is no longer in our presence, her essence lives in all that surrounds us. May we take comfort in this understanding while also acknowledging that grief is painful. However loving 
and being loved by Cricket is worth the despair that has brought you together today and will continue to bring you together in times to come. As in a conversation uh, with herself or perhaps with someone else, the poet Mary Oliver asks in her poem for Tom Shaw, where has this cold come from? It comes from the death of your friend. Will I always from now on be this cold? No, it will diminish, but always it will be with you. What is the reason for it? Wasn't your friendship always as beautiful as a flame? Cricket's friendship was a flame in our lives, beautiful and warm. And so we, her family and friends and neighbors, gather around this flame to share our gratitude for the way her life gave light to our lives. Here, as around a campfire, we are warmed by the stories and memories we share with one another. Here we tell and treasure times remembered with Cricket, family times, Muskoka times, camp times, cycling times, times in the garden, times on the front porch, meal times, times of conversation and laughter shared with love, and sometimes a cup of tea or a glass of wine. We tell and treasure the things that made Cricket unique, her big smile and infectious laugh, her curiosity, her tenacity, how she brought people together, and her love for and pride in her family. All these memories we tell and treasure today with gratitude and with joy. But today we are also living these words of Mary Oliver. We shake with joy we shake with grief. What a time they have, these two, housed as they are in the same body. In our bodies, we carry the joy of Cricket's life and love. In the body of this gathered people, we carry the joy of her life and love. But we also carry in our own bodies and as a gathered body, our disbelief our pain, the aching loss of her death. Here today, joy and grief are joined in each of us and in us as a body. But as we share our joy and grief together, we find healing and comfort and love. Cricket touched the lives of so many, not only those of us physically gathered or those who are joining us virtually online, but all those who we know Cricket interacted with during her time on Earth. As each of you know, Cricket took profound responsibility for how she lived her life and she oriented her actions toward creating room for all people to live to their fullest potential and to be affirmed and celebrated in their own truth. She lived her values out loud, and in doing so, she subtly called to action those who witnessed her. While I did not have the privilege of meeting Cricket while she was alive, I've been able to glean a sense of how cherished she was and remains through the many stories that have been shared with me and the memories that have been gathered up. Reading through the online condolences offered by former neighbors and elementary and high school classmates, there are common threads that are weaved throughout the reflections on Cricket's life. Cherished childhood bonds, her kind and welcoming disposition to neighbors, underscoring the importance of those community connections. As one former classmate fondly recalled Cricket's initi initiative to organize a luncheon for the 68 women of South spawned virtual but regular gatherings of a group of seven over the years. Her commitment to environmental stewardship is evidenced by her involvement with the Arthur Park 
Arthur Ford Nature Park, among many others, where every flower planted held symbolic meaning, a universal expression of the lasting impact she had on the people in her life and the void that has been left in her passing. I'd like to invite you to please take a moment, cast your eyes down or close them. And I want you to call up your own favorite recollection of Cricket. In doing so, bring her smile into focus. Let the memory of her laughter bubble up. Be reminded of the gentleness of her disposition and the integrity and grace she carried throughout her life. May you be reminded of the warmth of her embrace. It would have been important to Cricket that this gathering in her memory be upbeat, rooted in stories, in simplicity, in lightness, and in community. For this was her way to leave people or a landscape better off than when she greeted it. As I was preparing for today, I was reminded of a quote by Maya Angelou, a great soul serves everyone all of the time. A great soul never dies. It brings us together again and again. And in this way, Cricket continues to do this work of bringing together people again and again. Annie Cricket's sister shared her reflections about her sister likening her ways to the secret life of trees. She noted that in the quiet depths beneath our feet, trees, tree roots are intertwining, connecting, connecting and nurturing one another. These roots, roots reach out and touch one another, creating a vast underground network where information flows freely. When one tree is in need, others respond, sending nutrients, water, and even chemical signals to support one another, to support the fellow companions. It's a language older than time itself whispered in the quiet hum of the earth. It's a testament to the profound interconnectedness of all living beings and to the way Cricket valued her friendships, her relationships to other people, and to the earth she cared for. Also like the old trees that surround the neighborhood where Cricket lived, her very home tucked among them, these trees reach high towards the sky like strong, courageous women, standing the test of the season's elements just as Cricket withstood the hardships she overcame with commitment, with courage, with integrity, and with dignity. We will now transition into hearing from loved ones from different chapters of Cricket's life. Throughout this planning process, we came to recognize the impossibility that we could present a program today that could totally encapsulate all of the little pockets of Cricket's rich and meaningful life in one afternoon. And so we know that there's a whole list of people who would probably like to speak. What we're going to ask of you is that in the reception area, there is a memory jar and there are cue cards for you to write that favorite memory, a song, a food, a scent that when you call to mind, most reminds you of your time of cricket. And please deposit it into the memory jar so that the family can continue to draw on it in times to come. Another Mary Oliver poem it's called When I Am Among the Trees. And this is just the last few lines. Around me the trees stir in their leaves and call out, stay a while. The light flows from their branches and they call again. It's simple, they say. And you too have come into the world to do this, to go easy to be filled with light and to shine. Today, the stories we hear, tell, and remember will remind us how Cricket's life was filled with light and how it shone. And as we listen, speak, remember, 
The darkness of our grief will be filled with the light of laughter, gratitude, joy, and love. I get to go first because Cricket and I have been friends for 71 years. And I thought, I can't be that old, can I? <laughs> We've been friends ever since Cricket's sister, Anne, walked around by our house on Cathcart Street and saw my dad and I out on the front lawn and pointed at me and said to my dad, I have a sister her age. <laughs> and that was the beginning. As I was thinking about my memories and so many of Cricket, I was searching for an image to describe our friendship. And I thought of the rock, the granite rock of the Canadian Shield that means so much to both Cricket and I from our cottage experiences. From Muskoka and southern Georgian Bay northward, that rock underlies <coughs> everything. In places, the rock is visible, pink and gray granite veined with white quartz. In other places, the rock is covered with soil and those great, wonderful west, west wind pines. But even when you can't see the rock, it's there underneath everything. And that's what Cricket's friendship was like for me. We weren't always together. We didn't always see each other. There were times when we lived in different cities and our lives went in very different directions. But our shared history from the age of four was always a bedrock of friendship in our lives. Our shared childhood was very close. We lived around the corner, started kindergarten together at Mountsfield in 1955. And along with Peggy Parnell and Sandy Marshall were part of a group of which Cricket, among the four of us, was the heart the energizer, the constant presence, and the three of us kind of revolved around her like planets around the sun. One of my earliest memories is of a Christmas when Cricket received a blue-haired doll, three feet tall, with a frilly, beautiful blue dress, a straw bonnet, and I was so jealous of that <laughs> doll. But the funny thing was, we seldom played with dolls. <laughs> Cricket loved being outdoors, exploring the neighborhood, climbing trees, making tents, and sleeping out in the backyard, practicing high jump on a homemade high jump stand, going on bike rides, tobogganing at Rowley's Hill, skating at the outdoor rink between South and Tecumseh, where Cricket could shoot the duck better than anybody, <laughs> any of us, anyway. And in the summer, going to the PUC playground program at Mountsfield. Typically, on a weekend, Cricket would knock at our side door and ask my mom, can Annie come out to play? And typically, my mom would answer, her name is Anne. <laughs> Stop calling her Annie. <laughs> but Cricket never stopped, <laughs> even a week or so before her death when I shook her awake in the hospital. She looked at me and said, oh, hi, Annie. <laughs> she was stubborn that way. <laughs> Cricket was always very curious about what was going on in our neighborhood and loved exploring new houses under construction. One time we were exploring in a house on Baseline Road where it turned out later our friend Margie Simpson moved into when someone came in the house and we were in the basement <laughs> and the only way out was through a newly painted window. <laughs> so our handprints and footprints were <laughs> in that paint and then we ran through the backyard, through the Allen's backyard onto Elworthy in order to sca escape. And funnily enough, later, my mom and I moved into the Allen's house on <laughs> Elworthy. At the time I lived there, there was a fence across the back, which would have meant we might have to have found another route <laughs> out of our pickle there. One time, Cricket and I decided to ride our bikes to Port Stanley. 
I can't remember if we had our parents' permission or not, but we went, we went anyway <laughs> and got as far as Shaw's Dairy, <laughs> where we decided we'd gone far enough <laughs> and got, as Cricket called it, a cream cone. <laughs> and then we came home. Cricket and I went to camp together at Camp Queen Elizabeth for quite a few years. And whatever cabin group we were in had a reputation, um, how should I say it, for being a little unruly. <laughs> One year we even made up a song about shit disturbing <laughs> to sing at the camp talent night. <laughs> Uh, one, uh, I still remember that song too. I can <laughs> probably sing it if you want to hear it. <laughs> and all the names of the ones in that cabin group. When we were 16, Cricket and I were counselors in training together at Camp White Bear in Lake Tomogamy, the only camp that thought we might possibly be leadership material. <laughs> That was a wonderful experience, and both of us were half in love with our CIT leader, Dick Johnson. Oh, he was a wonderful man. <laughs> in the fall of 1972, I had finished Alt House, and I can't remember if Cricket had been... So she and I and my older brother, Jack, loaded up our backpacks, put on our patched 1970s jeans. Remember leather patches and not where there were holes or anything, but just because you had to have patches and flew to England. We had no plans, no itinerary, not much money, but we were young. <laughs> After a week in London, Cricket and I set out to hitchhike to Scotland by way of Cornwall <laughs> as we went. Only a few stories we could tell about truck drivers that we had uh, better left unsaid. <laughs> Cricket was a wonderful traveling companion. She was more outgoing than I was and brave and not afraid to ask. She was mostly very laid back and surprisingly okay with making it up as we went along. I think she lost a bit of that quality after Fergie died, um, needing to have maybe a little more control of things. We stayed in B&Bs and I was looking back through the letters I wrote home to my mom and we paid uh, anywhere from one pound fifty to four pounds a night. <laughs> At, at one B&B, there was this old lodger sitting uh, by the fire um, who frowned at our backpacks and patched jeans and called us dirty hippies, <laughs> <laughs> which probably wasn't too far from the truth since we hadn't done any laundry since we'd arrived in England. <clears throat> anyway, we took his criticism to, to heart and went to the laundromat. And after, when we came back, Cricket leaned over to the old gent and said, now we're clean hippies. <laughs> <laughs> after a month in England, we traveled with our friend Diane to the continent where we bought a 1965 Volkswagen van for $50. The drawback was that it had a very weak battery that meant we had to park on a downslope <laughs> and two of us had to push and I pushing. That Europe trip was a whirlwind of hostels, museums, churches and art galleries. Although often in later years, Cricket and I would remember it more as a five month bread and chocolate tour. <laughs> When we arrived home from that trip in the middle of the night, the taxi dr drop was underneath our friendship, running strong and true. So I'm going to end with a poem. It's a, by the camp poet, Mary S. Edgar. It's called Friendship. If life held nothing else but just the gift of friends, if but one friend were true until the long trail ends, if two kind eyes looked deep and clearly saw in you the best and worst there was, yet still believed you true, if even one strong hand could reach to you and give with strong understanding clasp a braver will to live, 
Life would be rich indeed and more than worth its tears, for friendship still abides beyond the farthest years. Thank you, Cricket, for your friendship. Don't forget that I love you. May I please invite forward Paula Coverley? this on the way here. <laughs> My name is Paula Coverley Neal. Most of you will remember that. Cricket and I have been friends also since kindergarten at Mountsfield Public School, South Collegiate and long after. Always reuniting through our friendship. So many memories have passed through my mind this week, too many to tell. I will highlight just a few. First one is, I think we were in high school. Cricket, Fergie, myself, and one other, and as I think about it, I think it was Dan Leah. Sneaking under the fence at Storybook Gardens. <laughs> In the dark of night, who knows what time it was. <laughs> Telling each other to stop laughing, which was really hard to do for Cricket and I. We didn't get caught, and we spent quite a bit of time wandering around Storybook Gardens in the dark. The next one is when Cricket and I wandered the halls of Mountsfield Public School when we shouldn't have been. This doesn't seem like very long ago. We found a door open. We decided I was visiting from Oshawa for a while and we found a door open after we walked over to Mountsfield School and we said, let's go in. <laughs> there were no children there, no kids, no students. It wasn't long that we were approached <laughs> and we both convinced him to tell us maybe where the registers were that all the names of the kindergarten class we could find our own and he did <laughs> I have a picture of that the two of us standing there holding our kindergarten registers with all the names and no one <laughs> The next one was convincing the elevator lady at King's Mills. <laughs> we went there on another visit that I had come down. We went there because it was going to close and that was very sad that King's Mills was going to close. So I have a picture again of us in the elevator and we did convince the lady to let us work it <laughs> and go from one floor to the next, moving the whatever it's called. Don't know what it's called, but anyway, we got to do it. We were both very convincing. Finally, and most recently, catching a mouse in Cricket's kitchen. <laughs> and throwing it out the window. <laughs> I think actually it was the front door. Penny, Judy, Toad, Sumner, Lynn, Sheila, Vise, Pam Young, and myself. We formed, we formed this bond just before COVID and we, we Zoom call once a month and chat about anything and everything. This connection will last forever, supporting each other through good and through bad. We always laughed at cricket. 
because she very often was the last one on the screen and we could never see her face because it was too dark. <laughs> Laura sent her a ring light. <laughs> it somewhat helped. <laughs> now our dear friend, your light will shine down on us every call. We will always be the group of seven. In closing, I would like to quote Winnie the Pooh. How lucky I am to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard. Rest in peace, our dear Cricket, from the group of seven. Thank you, Paula. May I please invite Gail White Malloy forward? Hi, everybody. I think there's a bit of a theme about convincing people. <laughs> so I'm starting mine off as I'm writing a letter to Cricket. Dear Cricket, it's been a while since we last connected, so I thought I would send you a quick email just to check in. I've had some time to think about our 40 year friendship, and you have become one of my best rock solid friends. Always, there's no, any, always, there's no matter what. You're always there, and the impact you have had on individuals' lives is far-reaching. You have made a difference in this world. As a single mom after Fergie's passing, you have raised, supported, and nurtured John and Kelly to instill in them values and principles they will carry throughout their entire lives. You did good, Cricket, and you would be so proud of them right now. We've had some great times and some sad times and lots of life in between. For the purpose of living your motto, live, laugh, and love, I picked a couple of funny stories that make me smile when thinking of you. Mooning, road trip, and customs officer. Oh, Nancy's smiling over there. One, one of the latest ones was with you, Nancy DePutter, and myself, having lunch on the outside front porch at the Ottawa Inn. It's very historic. It's very state. It's very reserved. And we were having lunch, and we sat beside a mutual friend. And while we were eating, this mutual friend came over and mooned us at the table. <laughs> okay. Knowing that we're all around 70 years old, the look on your face was priceless. A bunch of old ladies on the front porch mooning. We were goaded on to return the same moon to our friend's table. You were reluctant. And so underwear. <laughs> so I was happy to get an email from you telling you had gone out to purchase some nice undies <laughs> and that you are now ready, ready to moon someone. <laughs> the next funny memory I have is join me at a visited PEI and I met with the sales manager at the Charlottetown Ford dealership. He took a shine to you, of course, and this fellow usually lent us a car for the time I was on the island. Well, he ended up lending us a Mustang to drive for the five days we were on the island. And since I was working each day, he let you drive the car. So you would pick me up at the end of every day, and you would tell me about the tales of what you found out, what you did, who you met, and of course, how great it was to drive that car. So we called you Mustang Sally. <laughs> As you recall, when you drove and when you talked, you would take your foot off the gas to concentrate on talking. <laughs> Since talking and driving at the same time didn't work on a highway, I was going to make sure I had a yardstick or a broom to push down on your foot to remind you to drive at least above 20 kilometers. So the deal was, if you can't talk and drive at the same time, don't talk. <laughs> oh man, we laughed at anything and everything and you loved it all. The third story is from our adventure to Fort Erie. We stayed at a B&B &B around Welland and cycled for a few days and had planned to go across the border to buy some clothes for Blaze because at that point, Blaze was about six months old or something, I think. So it was a sunny day and we approached the customs booth. So we had already pre-planned this. And as we approached the customs booth, we're waiting in the cars and you said to me, I don't think I have my passport or my SIN number or anything with me. It's like, are you kidding me? 
<laughs> so I asked you to vision yourself being in Target across the border, buying some really cute outfits for plays, and to ask the spirit guides and angels to make sure we got a really nice customs mm -hmm. officer. So you were smirking and laughing and saying out loud to those above, help us get across the border. After a 50 minute chat and some pleading, the customs officer led us across the border. I had my passport, so only one illegal was crossing. <laughs> you couldn't believe it worked. It was your charming personality that got us through. Day was spent shopping and upon coming back across the border, we hit the Canadian customs. And what we forgot to do was ask the spirit guides to give us a really nice custom doctor on the way back. So, not so nice, she was female, she just did her job, but she couldn't understand how we had let across the border without the proper documentation. And after a stern review of us, our shopping and what we looked like, she let us go. Who gets let back into Canada without any documentation? I don't know anyone else who can get to the United States and then back into Canada without documentation to prove they're Canadian. Only you could do this. Mm -hmm. So after that, you were more inclined to believe in asking above for a favor too. So until we meet again, my dear friend, I know the spirit guides and angels will welcome you. And before they know it, you'll be asking a million questions, <laughs> planning an outing and more. So that's it for now. Lots of love. Ian and Kimberly, can I invite you to come forward? Do you have something to say? Oh, Anne, sorry. I didn't have the list, but come on oh. in. Yeah, come on in. Yeah, you, you go for it. Yeah, you can do absolutely. <laughs> come on in. to change this a little bit because I'm so impressed by what Gail said. <laughs> I was driving to say goodbye to Cricket a few days ago in the rain at 12.30 in the morning. So I said out loud, Allison, True. this is too hard. Please stop the rain. And by the time we got to the other side of Kitchener, the rain had stopped. By the time we got to London, the pavement was dry. And I also got to listen to one of my favorite songs, which was, <laughs> somebody's gonna help me with this, <laughs> uh, The Waters, Waters of March. March. Yeah. If you know what, it's wonderful if you don't listen to it. Anyway, I would like to share some of my memories with you and to offer some treasured moments. Some of my earliest memories of Allison and I are of our trips to the old Simpson store at the corner of Dundas and Richmond. Some of you may remember that. Back then in the 60s, this was quite a stately building. High end, you might say. I think the second floor east side of the elevator, or of the escalator, had the women's hat department. Some of these were very fancy hats and we would try them on and laugh at each other and ourselves in the mirror. We all should have worn fascinators. Mm -hmm. We may have learned from this from our mother. Allison told me our mother once stood with a lampshade on her head and then launched into her version of an opera. Both the Goads and the Archibalds had a pretty good sense of humor <laughs> and maybe a hankering for the stage. Also, Allison and I traveled together on occasion. We went north to Algonquin and Muskoka, often her idea, south to the Caribbean, her idea, and east to the Maritimes and Cornwall, England, my idea. Um, one of my favorite memories is from the Caribbean. We would dock during the day so passengers could visit the sites on land and in the evening, we returned to the ship for dinner. Initially, we ate in the dining room, but tiring of that formality, we found there was a deck outside where we could eat and drink and enjoy the warm sea breezes, the sound of the waves, and the starlit sky on our own. Allison loved this part of the cruise experience. And once we discovered this option, we never went back to the dining room. Family has been important to both of us. 
and we brought our parents and our families together to share holiday celebrations in London and KW. I especially remember the food, not surprisingly if you know Alison. <laughs> we often stuck to traditional dishes and at Christmas celebrated Christmas Eve together. Torchair or shepherd's pie, as well as on Christmas Day, where we got on to Allison's favorite desserts, Christmas cake, Nanaimo bars homemade, and trifle with either instant vanilla or coconut pudding. I will remember also the special network of friends Allison has. Friends were very important to her, and I benefited as well from the loving friendships that Allison built and nourished. She really enjoyed a barbecue with a finagle chef, often David, <laughs> or a drink and apps on the porch. Neighborhood and community was also important to her. There was nothing like Old South. Last October, she was part of a manageable medical expenses. She put her heart into that endeavor along with others in the neighborhood, and it meant a lot to her. And she especially loved her house, the cottage in the trees. So, Allison, I wish you safe travels. Lots of love always in my heart. And I'd like to read a poem, if I can get through it. <laughs> it's titled Sisters by Kate Marshall Flaherty. And it's in honor of Allison's cottage in the trees, her love of the garden, and she would correct me, she'd say gardening, <laughs> and the strength of women. Sisters, shush like nurses, leaf breeze shimmering, underside silver green. I feel your gnarled roots fingering deep into the earth, as grounded as I wish to be. Sisters, you who tickle heaven with tender, with slender tips, who stand dirt sure, may I bask in the cool shade of your wisdom. You speak to me, whispering tree secrets, in the language of lush and leafy greens exhaling inspiration, gifts of breath we give each other. Okay, this is a, another poem that Brendan liked and thought he would like to have this spoken at Allison's. <coughs> Memorial. Brendan isn't able to be here. Hi, Brendan, wherever the <laughs> camera is. <laughs> so this uh, poem is called Sometimes, and it's from a, a collection of poems, Frost on the Sun. Sometimes we are shattered. The coherence gone, the planets of our brain sail loosely in their microcosmic air. Sometimes we can pick up nothing, start nothing, poise lost, stance lost, neither in the wind nor out of it. We must wait on choppy seas till the wind turn, till the moon come round and the wind and with you in our hearts. May I please invite forward Nancy and John to putter.
<sighs> what does the life well lived look like? <clears throat> Well, I think if anyone could show us, it would be Cricket. And today my tribute to her is all about time. It's about how she took time to see the beauty and the worth in the everyday simple things that often go so unnoticed. Time to create an effortless flow in a garden, tenderly designed with heart and soul working alongside and in unison with nature to create not just a place full of plants, but a sanctuary where one could find joy and delight and peace. I was one of the lucky ones to receive such gardens. She died last November. In it, she says, of course, many of us need and take great satisfaction in building resumes, portfolios, bucket lists and the like, but let's not forget about the bigger picture as we go. Things like love and kindness, appreciation of the small things, companions, can at Mountsfield Public School, organizing and planning South Secondary School reunions even as recent as this past summer. And then there were the itineraries for the Huff and Puff bicycle group getaways. Of course, the planning of countless neighborhood parties that will be fondly remembered for years to come. But even when Cricket had projects on the go, she still had time to spare. If you were up for a road trip, she found the time. If you wanted to try that new, like, new Mexican place on the other side of the town, she found the time. And if you were going through a really tough time and just needed a friend to talk to, she always found the time. And whether you were family or a friend, a neighbor, or even a stranger, her heart was wide open to all in the kindness of her eyes, my very closest and dearest friends for almost 45 years. And I will take this, that time passes all too quickly, and what we choose to do with it really does count. So thank you, Crick. I'll miss you and I love you. Well, here we are today and involved with an event, a celebration of Cricket's life that has evoked many, many memories. And um, also the theme being the time that Cricket and I. We had just moved to Devonshire Ave, and I walked down the street one day, and Cricket was on her front lawn, as she, I would learn she would known, be known to be. And she sauntered over. Cricket sauntered. <laughs> I see some people with bike shirts on here. I don't think you'd go for lightning fast biking trips with Cricket. She sauntered. She didn't sprint. She had no sense of urgency. So she sauntered over and asked me about myself and my wife. She wasn't nosy. She just wanted to make friends. And uh, she did make friends. And she did that over and over. This is just exemplary of who she was about. She made friends, and many of you today will have a memory of meeting her and getting to know her and developing a friendship. Recall some of you from Devonshire Ave, the old Devonshire garage sales. We'd shut the street right off, and um, it was participated in and led by Jim and Cricket. And uh, one year, Fergie had uh, one of the cars that he was trying to sell, and it is, is uh, related to his car sales work, uh, an antique car parked there, and the Crinklaws were cooking hot dogs as early as 8 or 9 in the morning. And Cricket was there, of course, engaged in this. This was all about what she really loved, you know, garage sales and having the community together and so forth. 
There's sad experiences and memories too. We all, many of us remember the day Fergie died. Tough times. And a lot of our memories of cricket involved the outdoors. You might remember having her over to review your garden and design it and beautify your property. I had lunch with a friend in North London not long ago, and I was talking about this friend that we have who had these, this illness, these symptoms and so forth. And as I talked with him and we went back and forth, uh, the name, I used the term cricket. He said, cricket? <laughs> and he said, I know who she is. She designed our garden. And he said, she had all this beautiful design and she stamped it with a cricket. I don't mean a live cricket. I mean, <laughs> you know, a cricket, a cricket stamp. And he remembered her, so couldn't forget. She had an idealistic side to her, a bit of a whimsical side, a bit of child in her, you know. And um, so she goes to Europe several years ago and comes back, and most people would come back with landmark pictures and so forth. No, Cricket comes back with pictures of doorsteps <laughs> and crickets of little, pictures of little plants and so forth. And plants, by the way, were never it but him. I think he'll look good here. Just give him a half turn. <laughs> you know, uh, and breakfast was never breakfast. It was brekkie. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we've got many memories here. She always took the scenic route. <laughs> Bakeries. <laughs> You don't go to Toronto on the 401, you go on the old number two. <laughs> so on her 60th birthday, I had the pleasure of writing a little poem about her. And I told this, delivered this poem on her 60th birthday and her 70th birthday. And now today, and I'm going to alter slightly the last line, and it's, it's in your little memory folder here. Alison Ferguson, our great long-term friend, always there for a visit, a talk, an attentive ear to lend. You've been so near and dear to us on Devonshire, Elworthy, Cathcart, so helpful, so kind, so funny, so smart. Your heart may sometimes be north in Muskoka, or during the winter thinking south down to Boca. You do like to travel, to drive, to do towns. Locally, worldly, you have made the rounds. And we sure love to see the pictures you take, because when you go to see things, you see things so little yet great. Old doorsteps and sunsets and trees that enthrall. You see beauty that others would not notice at all. We've seen you endure some deep grief and sadness and life when it all seemed like terrible madness. But you have come through it. Your motto, just do it. It's true that you're creative, talented, gifted, so many gardens to a new higher level you've lifted. With your designing and landscaping, painstaking arranging, there's always a project there for you for the taking. We see you as natural, like the growth of your greenery. You are what you are, as is God's own scenery. A woman with wisdom and talent multiplicity, yet at the same time such warm, simple simplicity. A person whose big smile, loud laugh, funny joke, in our own minds and faces, lots of fun does invoke. At peace in a garden and in sync with the earth, you're giving your life in a way of full worth. So we celebrate, salute you, and happily cheer you. Today is a big one, so glad now to be near you. Of course, we can't, but if it was that our life we could pick it, I, we, we'd sure want to do it again with you, Cricket. <laughs> like the sun in the morning, the plants in the dew. You have had your time here, and we all love you. May I please invite John and Kelly? Uh, 
Huh? Why don't we beat that? Right? <laughs> uh, we might. Uh, uh. I like the challenge. Yeah. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank everyone um, for rallying this whole time in this hard time for my brother and I, whether it be you bringing us a meal, a message, showing up on the porch, we thank you. Um, Network of people. Community, yeah. Um, like trees. <laughs> um, our mom was a beacon of light in what sometimes is a pretty dark world. There's a lot of heavy stuff going on. Um, people really graduate, gra gravitated, sorry, gravitated to her, I found. She lit up a room, every room she went into. Um, with my brother and I, she instilled so many values and lessons. Um, she always taught us, don't lie, be honest. Even though sometimes I'm sure my delivery <laughs> isn't uh, the greatest. Sometimes she'd be like, well, did you say it like that, Cal? <laughs> it's like, so I'll work on that. <laughs> um, she had an undying loyalty to everyone in her life. Um, but you always made time also for yourself. So my friends know when I say, I need a Kelly day, like they get it. <laughs> um, mom had a lot of battles she had to overcome, but she did it every time. Um, she taught us to know right from wrong and always make good decisions. Um, I had a very, for lack of better words, diverse group of friends. Mm -hmm. um, every culture, race, background. The house on Elworthy was their safe space. She welcomed these people in when no one else did. She saw them for the people they were when no one else did. And they really appreciate that and always will. Like they would say things like she cooked us breakfast, which to everyone else that's like, yeah, you cook people breakfast. But for them, it was a huge thing. Um, she was a woman of <laughs> symbolism and signs. Um, there was a meaning behind everything. With her, even the day she passed was National Gardening Day. <laughs> so <laughs> even to her, Literal last day, there was symbolism. Um, the last month was the hardest month of our life. Um, but she would always find silver linings. <laughs> there would always be like, a look for the happy moments. So even in her hardest days, I would look, even if it was a little smirk. Um, just something. Um, she was also still, even though she, as much as she wasn't herself, she still was very much herself. <laughs> there was just these little things she would do, like she would say the funniest things still. And like, um, I wasn't gonna say this one, but once I heard the Reverend say shit disturbing, I was like, well, I'm saying it. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, she had a catheter <laughs> and uh, she wasn't very enthused about having it and uh, she just, I have two vaginas. <laughs> um, and then one of my best friends came to visit her and uh, he was, she, he asked her a question and she was kind of like just laying there and then she wasn't saying anything and then He's like, oh, she's collecting her thoughts. And then she just said, you're collecting her thoughts. <laughs> and then just like smirked. And it was the funniest thing. Um, growing. The candy too. Some, I remember, uh, I think it was at University Hospital. Somebody was digging in their purse for candy or a mint or something. And uh, that my mom heard her or him because I can't remember who it was now 
And uh, she said, what do you have in there? <laughs> and there's like rustling in her purse and everything, or her, or her pockets or something. And she's like, she says, do you have any bridge mix or licorice all sorts? <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought it was so funny because I thought Grady, which was her mom, Evelyn Goad, was the one that liked licorice all sorts, mm -hmm. not mom. She kind of had these weird, sometimes she'd get weird cravings for food. Like she wanted all the milk, good stuff. Chocolate milk. <laughs> she uh, drank more chocolate milk, I think, in three weeks than I've seen in my entire life. I, she used to tell, tell us that she was lactose intolerant. So, <laughs> like, what happened? Seeing her drink chocolate milk in the last weeks was quite interesting. And An adventure. And really. she would always drink 1%, but she would always be like, give me 2% milk. So we're like, get the lady what she wants. <laughs> there was, I kind of called myself her like food pusher by the end, cause she would, I'd walk in the room and she'd be like, hey Cal, uh, what about a Dandy's burger? And I was like, you want a seven ounce burger right now? <laughs> like I, uh, she's like, well, I was thinking about it. <laughs> but the weird thing is I'd ordered it the night before so I was like, there's weird signs, symbolism. Um, growing up, um, John and I would always see as kids kind of like take off and wander, whether it be like <laughs> the grocery store or anywhere really, but she would always have this whistle. <laughs> Can you do that? No. Yeah, I was like, my lips are dry. Um, I, I got lost. And, uh, well, all the Devonshire people know that I was probably banned from the hose. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to touch sprinklers or water of any type. Yeah, a few babysitters I squirted with the hose, I think. <laughs> and then their parents would come and talk to my parents and stuff and say, well, we have to talk about this. We, we don't think our daughter's cut out right to babysit your son. <laughs> but anyway, don't get any ideas, please. <laughs> um, basically, I think it was Ultramart. It was uh, Commissioners in Wonderland. It used to be a store there. Well, there still, it still is now. It's a food basics. But that place was massive, and I got lost in there. And Mom couldn't find me for, like, maybe 20 minutes. But I was just wandering the aisles because I would just kind of go off on my own. So she had to come up with this whistle system. I didn't know she did it for Kelly too. Oh yeah. But that was it. That was the whistle. Because I kept doing it for years after. I still do it with Erica now. <laughs> but she doesn't whistle. So she get she just jump she just gets mad now. She's like, Where did you go? Just wandering. Gotta keep moving, you know. <laughs> But it was where, speaking of signs, yesterday before the visitation, I had happened to open a window and then a bird was doing the same whistle mm -hmm. over and over and over. Um, so with the signs and symbolism and the whistle, um, with the whistle especially, we always end up finding her, you know, whether it be <laughs> in a grocery store or anywhere, but we always found her so now that you're not here um whether it be the sound of a loon the water trees we'll always find you we'll always find you we love you <laughs> you were the best person ever. Maybe we're biased, but. <laughs> <laughs> and all these values she taught us, we're gonna keep the legacy alive and keep living keep through her with our teach, values. Teach the, Got some kids, kids to kids, teach too, kids. right? <laughs> so, but yeah, her legacy will forever live on. But yeah, she's everywhere, so just. You'll feel her, you'll see her, you'll every hear time, her. Every time something blooms. Yeah. Every time 
there's new buds on a tree, <laughs> tiger lilies, stuff like that. Yeah. She's here. <laughs> And so we see how Cricket's life shone. And we see right over here how Cricket's light still shines and will go on shining. We see among us that light that is shining, that shone and is still shining. At the end of her poem in Blackwater Woods, Mary Oliver writes, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time has come to let it go, to let it go. Cricket loved this life. She loved what is mortal, people, trees, flowers. She held it all close to her bones, knowing that her life depended on interconnectedness and love. But when the time came, this past Sunday morning early, she let it go. And this is what we can learn from here, what we can take, as Kelly says, as her legacy in our lives, to love our lives, everyone and everything, even though it will die to hold what we love and who we love close to our bones, embracing everyone and everything fiercely and with gratitude. And when the time comes, to let it go, to open our hands and let it go, as we now let go of Cricket's mortal life. But as long as we hold our memories and one another against our bones, Cricket will always be a flame warming and giving light. And we will give thanks with joy for her friendship and love. Being a minister, I can't help but say amen. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. As we honor Cricket's memory, let us take comfort in knowing that indeed her legacy of growth, beauty, and reverence for all things living will continue to flourish in the gardens, in the family members, in the relationships that you all hold dear, tended to with love. The greatest tribute you can pay to Cricket's legacy, as has been said, is to live your life to the fullest, embracing each day with joy, with grief, with relief, whatever it invites into your world, and to seize on the opportunity to see the magic in the everyday, to harness the zest that there is in the living, and to honor how Cricket introduced and lived her way in this world. In a world so often marked by heaviness and intolerance, search for opportunities to show kindness to one another, grace and compassion, forgive easily. In doing so, you honor Cricket's memory and keep her legacy indeed rippling forward. A reception has been arranged by the family. However, it's a smaller little space, so please take advantage of the sun that looks like it's peeked out from behind the clouds so that we can make room for all to express condolences for the family as they gather. Again, the memory jar is in the reception space, so please do take advantage of leaving any thought, memory that comes to mind when you think of the remarkably full life that Cricket has lived. And so immediately following, the recep immediately following the ceremony, you're going to follow family and myself and Reverend Ann as we go over into the reception hall. Thank you.